Well, <clears throat> thank you, Chief, for this very nice introduction. And thank you all for having me here. It's really a big honor and a great pleasure to be here at the Office of Population Research. So today, I'm going to talk about my recent research on using various types of social media data in order to estimate migration. But I'm going to start by saying that, uh, as uh, Chi mentioned in my introduction, I've been very fortunate to be part of uh, three wonderful and complementary uh, centers at the University of Washington, the Center for Studies in Demography and Ecology, which uh, deals with population research, the Center for Statistics and the Social Sciences, which focuses on quantitative methods, and the eScience Institute, which is the data science hub at the University of Washington. So the eScience Institute was, uh, was started out as a collaboration between computer scientists, oceanographers, and astronomers. Oh, the, can you hear me now a little bit better? Well, cool. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll try to sp I'll try to speak louder. <laughs> so I was saying that the eScience Institute started out as a collaboration between computer scientists, oceanographers, and astronomers, and then uh, became uh, more widely uh, sort of other disciplines became part of the of the institute. And so by hanging out with people at the eScience Institute. I got to learn that at the University of Washington, there's been a long tradition of uh, oceanographic studies, which is not too surprising given the position of Seattle near the ocean. So this is uh, how oceanography used to be done. People take their boats and they went out <laughs> to sea and they collected data. They really observed the ocean. So, now things are in some ways similar and in some ways different. So oceanographers still go out with their ships and they collect samples, and that's part of what they do. But a lot more oceanographers also spend a lot of time in their labs collect, analyzing data that have been collected using a number of uh, sensors placed at the bottom of, uh, of the sea. So some of the fundamental questions on, in uh, oceanography have not changed. But new types of data, complemented with uh, traditional data, are allowing oceanographers to get new insights into long-standing problems. So this is uh, not something that is specific to oceanography. Pretty much uh, all fields of discovery are transitioning from data poor to data rich, and they're becoming more and more computationally intensive. So if we think, for instance, at uh, astronomy, astronomy relies on uh, uh, big telescope that collect terabytes of data every night and transfer those data to data centers. These are sort of big observatories of the sky. If we think of uh, neuroscience, neuroscience relies on data from fMRIs or, va or various types of sensors, and so we can think of those as brain observatories. Similarly, transportation studies is being transformed by the a number of data that come from sensors that are placed on roads, on sidewalks, on poles, in public uh, transportation systems, and so on. And so one of, the, one of the big questions for me is, well, what about demography? And so I see three main trends in this area. The first trend is about the sort of rebirth of old data or traditional data. So these are data that uh, are very useful. They used to be on paper, and so they were very hard to access. They're being digitized, like administrative records, historical records, and they're becoming more usable for research. The second trend is about uh, new data. These are data that did not exist a few decades ago. These are data from social media, from the web, from cell phone data, and so on. And so these are data that were not designed for research purposes. And then there is a third trend they like to call old new approaches, which is the idea that uh, <clears throat> we're building on traditional principles or old principles 
in the context of new data. And at the same time, new data are forcing us to rethink some of the approaches and to uh, innovate in that sense in order to fully leverage the new types of data that are becoming available. So new data are particularly relevant in the context of migration. So when we think of international migration, that's the major source of uncertainty for demographic projections, like mid-range demographic projections, say 10 to 25 <laughs> years in the future. But even if we don't look at the future, even if we consider the present, a lot is not known about the present. So for example, data on age and sex <coughs> specific migration flows are largely inexistent for a number of uh, countries. And even when uh, they do exist, they're often inconsistent across countries. This is not only in developing countries, but if we think of countries like Italy and Spain, if you want to know the flows from Italy to Spain in 2015, if you ask uh, Spain, they would tell you about 17,000 people. If you ask Italy, they would tell you about 5,000 people. And that's because the data are collected differently. In one case, it's the sending country. In one case, it's the receiving country. There are different incentives to register or deregister, and, and so on. And so uh, a lot of my, my, my work in this area has been about combining various types of new and traditional data in order to get some new perspectives on migration. For instance, I've been using data like geolocated email data, or professional histories from LinkedIn, or migration histories from Google+, or geolocated Twitter data to evaluate trends. Now, we can think of uh, internet and social media as a discontinuity. So suddenly we have all these new types of data that are available and that could be leveraged for migration studies. Some of these uh, data sources may not last in the future, so some of them may be, might be here for another few years and may disappear. Some new sources may, uh, may come in. And so it's important to ask what will remain constant in this sort of uh, continuously changing context. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a few elements that will remain constant, for example, the use and the production of geolocation data will remain constant over time. That, that is something that is being useful and it uh, typically, typically appears across platform. And so I think that developing methods for geolocated data is, uh, is valuable moving forward. Also, I think that uh, the interest of advertisers is not likely to change in the near future. And so all the data that are produced <laughs> with advertisers in mind will uh, will stay in, uh, in the near future. One other element that uh, I think is going to persist in the future is related to the situation of uh, scientists and social scientists. And what I mean by that is that as social scientists, we are in a situation similar to Plato's allegory of the cave. In other words, we are sitting facing the wall. We know that there is some truth behind us, but all we can see are shadows of the truth, that is a distorted uh, representation of the truth. And so we need to develop methods to make sense of these biased representations of the truth in order to understand the underlying population. So in other words, I think that more and more we will have to deal with uh, non-representative samples and how to analyze those types of data. So that was uh, a long introduction, but uh, what, uh, what I want to talk about with this uh, presentation are two examples of ongoing projects that I'm working on. The first one is about using macro level data from social media, in particular Facebook data for advertisers in order to evaluate stocks of migrants. And this is a situation where we have some data and we have ground truth data and we want to understand biases. And then the second example is about micro-level data. These are geolocated Twitter tweets that uh, we're interested in using to understand relationships between short-term migration rates and longer-term uh, movements. 
And so in this case, <coughs> we don't have uh, uh, ground truth data, and so we need to develop other approaches. And finally, I want to situate this line of work within the general or the broader field of uh, digital demography. And if you have any questions, please stop me any time. So I'm going to start with the first project that is about macro social media data and using Facebook data for advertisers. So this is an ongoing project with uh, Ingmar Weber and Krishna Gamadi. And the first paper was actually published just last week on uh, uh, population and development review. Now, online advertising is booming. So anytime we use any sort of platform, whether it's Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Google, we are shown ads that are targeted to our location, to our interest, to our demographic characteristics, and, uh, and so on. And so online advertising is basically the uh, main source of revenue for social media data. And so a company like Facebook makes it very easy for people who want to advertise to do so. So say that if you want, that you want to create an ad on Facebook, that's very easy. You just need to go to facebook.com slash business. You click on create an ad, and then you'll be shown something like this. It's a form where you can choose who you want to target with your ad. So in this example, it may be a little bit small to see, but I chose to target people who live in New York State between the age of 30 and 60, both men and women, who are expats from Italy with a college degree, with college graduates or higher. And so if, uh, if I do that, then uh, Facebook gives me an answer, and I'm going to zoom in on that. So Facebook tells me that there is a potential reach of 8,900 people. In other words, the Facebook estimates that there are 8,900 uh, people who match who are monthly active users who match my uh, characteristics, who match the characteristics that they put in, that are uh, Italians living in New York State and, uh, and so on. And it does that based mostly on uh, information that users provide on Facebook, like uh, hometown and ca current country of residence, with the network structure of users, whether they're friends in two different uh, countries, and with the uh, geolocated logins of users, where people log in over time. And so these, uh, this data comes for free, so we can use it. If uh, at, at this point, this data is typically used by advertisers to decide on their budget. If they have more money, perhaps they have a broader scope. If they, have, if they don't have enough resources, maybe they, they can create a narrower audience. But this uh, tool can also be used for demographic research to get some sense of the demographic characteristics of users, as well as, uh, as a tool for survey research. Yeah? You mentioned the some of this data is provided by the users and some of it is basically imputed by yeah. Facebook. Do you, I, I agree this is a very exciting approach, but how much do you know about how Facebook is doing that imputation and how stable that process is? Yeah, so, so that, that's a very good question. So Facebook does not, uh, uh, it does not provide much information. Like in this specific case, and, and so, and all of the, sort of information that is posted on their website is intended for advertisers, not really for science. But uh, people internally at Facebook also publish some work. And so what we could do was to look at this data and some of the tables that people publish from internally at Facebook, and we check that uh, the sort of hierarchies match. And we sort of assume that the methods that they describe in their published work is consistent with these uh, methods. But it's true that like, uh, we, we don't really know if Facebook tonight decides to change the algorithms, then it will be very hard for us to know that. Could you at least check the internal consistency? So if you say the number of Italians who have gone to college in New York should be uh, less than the number of Italians in New York or something like that, where you could, there are certain relationships that have to be true. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you can, uh, you can check some, uh, uh, some, something related to internal consistency. And uh, so for instance, uh, if you do, if what we did was to create queries for smaller areas and then aggregate up okay. and see whether like they make sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually they make, uh, they make sense. Like uh, they don't exactly match because there are, there are all sorts of uh, uh, rounding. So for instance, uh, if you see a number that is 20, that means zero. So a value of 20 in this context is 20 or less. And so if there's nobody that matches your criteria, you never get a zero, you still get a 20. So there are a few sort of rounding issues like that. But uh, yeah, the idea is to sort of check for these uh, consistencies or inconsistencies. OK. so. So we could look at this data, and if we had to do it manually, it would be a little bit tedious. But luckily, uh, Facebook has an API, a marketing API, that is fairly well documented. And so we could actually extract the data uh, fairly, fairly quickly. And so, so we did. We got some data, and then we decided to compare that data with the American Community Survey. So here is, a, is an example related to migration. So in this chart, each data point represents a country of origin and the US state of destination. So for instance, these are Mexicans in New Mexico with a value on the y-axis from uh, the American Community Survey, the fraction of foreign born according to the American Community Survey. And uh, on the x-axis is the fraction of expats according to Facebook. This uh, dashed red line is a 45 degree line. And the blue data are the same data in this plot, just on a log-log scale. And so this, uh, this chart showed us that there is some signal there. There may be a lot of noise, but there's also some, some signal. If we look at the log-log plot, there's a fairly linear relationship. We could also say that, uh, well, Facebook tends to underestimate migrants. Most of the data points tend to lay above the 45 degree line, but it gives us a sense that potentially there, there is some information there that could be extracted. We also looked at uh, something similar in the context of uh, various countries in the world. So for this plot, each data point is one country in the world, and the values represent the fraction of migrants from all other countries in the world. And we compare the data from the uh, World Bank against the data from Facebook. And this line is, the, is a simple regression line. So what we see here is that the relationship is not as strong as for the US. We might expect that different countries might be biased in different ways. But there's still a fairly uh, strong relationship, together with some clusters. So we can see that all African countries tend to be clustered below the regression line. European countries tend to be clustered above. So it gives us a sense that there is potentially something, but there are also a number of biases that are hidden there. Yeah? So I think these are surprisingly good. This is better than I expected it. How, especially because the so-called ground truth is measured there also. Right? Like there's sampling uncertainty in ACS mm -hmm. estimates of small groups. Yeah. So how, how do you think about quantifying uncertainty I mean, so we know how to quantify the uncertainty in the ACS. How do you think about quantifying the uncertainty in this other source of data? Yeah, so, yeah, so that's a good question. And uh, the tricky part, I would say, is that when I think of uncertainty, I usually tend to think first at sampling uncertainty. But in this case, most of the uncertainty is not necessarily related to sampling. Yeah. It's more related to bias. and. Uh, all sorts of biases. So the proportion of uncertainty that is related to bias is much bigger than the proportion of uncertainty related to sampling. And uh, well, maybe like, I'll talk a little bit about the bias, and we'll see if that sort of like addresses a little bit your question. We can talk a little bit further about that, which is a, a very important question. But it's also, so just to give you a sense, Facebook also gives a lot of information about other things like interest. So for instance, it would tell you how many people, uh, like it would give you estimates of people who have young kids, for example. 
because that's interesting for advertisers. They want to advertise it when you have a young kid or like when, when you have a newborn. And so for things like that, it's much harder. So the, the estimates, we took a look at those as well, and the estimates do not line up as well because I think it's much harder to estimate whether you had a child or not than whether you sort of like, uh, you're from Italy and you live in the US. So I think like things with location are fairly easy to estimate. Things related to interest are a bit harder. Can you do yeah. this on, on active Facebook accounts? Yes. Because people deactivate, but I understand they don't ever go away. <laughs> <laughs> they still have your accounts, even though it may not be open to the public. So can you access those that have been deactivated as well as, or only those that are currently active? Yeah, well, I'm, so I'm not sure, I didn't read about that, but like my guess is that since this is for advertisers, they're interested in active users. So that's what I would say. And it's actually, well, it actually, yes, yeah, so, sorry, so the, the measurement is actually for monthly active users, so non-active users are not there. So we looked at Profile, so we thought like perhaps there are biases that are related to different age groups. And so we looked at profiles by age and sex. So here is an illustrative example with uh, Mexicans, men and women in California and Texas. So this is an extreme example. Like we have the ACS, that's the red line, and then the dashed line is Facebook data for the fraction of people in, uh, in the state. And so we see that even though like at an aggregate level, things look fairly uh, consistent, when we start disaggregating things, we see uh, bigger biases. For young age groups, the two data sources line up fairly well, but for older age groups, we see that there is a big bias between sort of Facebook and the ACS. And this could be related to all sorts of things. It could be that older people, you do not use Facebook or older people use Facebook but they don't put much information or older people put as much information in terms of like uh, home, hometown and current city but they don't spend enough time on Facebook to reveal other, informations, other information about where, where they are. So that could be all sorts of biases. But what we, th we think is interesting in this case is that uh, the biases tend to be sort of consistent across states. And so if we can model those biases, we can sort of borrow strength across states and uh, understand some of these biases in order to make uh, corrections. So this is just uh, an illustrative example to get a sort of more systematic assessment of these biases. We run a simple regression model. We're on the left-hand side, we have the foreign-born population from country I to US state J by age group Z. We had the respective value from Facebook. And then we had a, a set of dummy variables for countries of origin and for age groups. So these dummy variables are intended to serve as some sort of a level parameter. Each country has its own uh, level and some sort of shape parameter. Different age groups have different uh, biases attached to, attached to them. And so we, we got a table, there are a lot of numbers here. I think the, the interesting ones are the age groups, and so I'm going to zoom on those. So we see that the coefficients tend to be negative for young age groups, meaning that on average, Facebook tends to overestimate migrants for younger age groups and tends to underestimate migrants for older age groups, which is not uh, surprising, is, is in similar to what we saw in the, in the example. Yeah? Um, I understand how Facebook could underestimate migrants, but in what way would they would, would there be an overestimate? Would it be that like, migrants are more likely to be active than being born in, among those ages, or what would be? I think that, that could be the case. It could be that migrants, uh, if migrants use Facebook more than the average person of the same age in the US, uh -huh. 
uh, or if a migrant puts more information, uh, uh, yeah, if a migrant puts more information on their profile than the average population, there could be there could be a reason, I would say. <coughs> Okay, so once we sort of got those, uh, those values, then we thought, well, can we perhaps predict the total number of uh, foreign born from country I in state J? Say, if we want to know how many Mexicans live in California or how many Italians live in New York, can we say something about that? So what we did was that we divided the data into a training set with 80% of the US states of destination and a test set with the remaining 20%. And then we <coughs> estimated a sort of naive model where we do not account for biases related to age and country of origin, and a model where we disaggregate by age and uh, country of origin. And so what, uh, what we got was that uh, the mean absolute percentage error on the on a number of test uh, trainings or test uh, sets tend to be quite high when we do not disaggregate by age and sex. When we do not account for those differences, we get 56%. And it goes down quite a bit when we account for these differences by age and sex. And so the idea here is that once we, if we can account for various biases, uh, in different subgroups of the population. And it's something that, like, the idea is in a way similar to the post certification That might help us uh, predict, uh, uh, make predictions. And then there are trade-offs, like, uh, ideally, we would sort of slice up things in, more, in uh, smaller groups. But then, like, we cannot slice it up too much. Otherwise, we would have lots of empty cells. And so there are trade-offs there. Now. So at, at this point, so this is like the, the next steps in, in, this, uh, in this project are about combining additional data from DSES. So, so far, we've been looking only at sort of one snapshot of the population according to Facebook and one snapshot from the American Community Survey. But the American Community Survey has been around for a while, so we have time series, and we can also combine that information. One of the for instance, when we look at Facebook data only, we do not have any constraints on uh, age patterns. But as demographers, we know that there are some regularities in age patterns that we want to sort of account for. And so the idea is that we can use a, a model based on principal component analysis, some, something similar to a Lee Carter model, but instead of using mortality rates, we use migration to sort of add some constraints on uh, age patterns. So for example, if we look at times, like if we look at profiles by age for the American Community Survey, these are Mexicans in California, we see that there are sort of like some predictable changes over time, changes in level, changes in shape, and so on. And so we can, we can leverage that. If uh, when we test this simple model, it's sort of simple Lee Carter model with migration, this is an example of, uh, of results. So the American Community Survey data for 2015 is the red line. We use data up until 2014 from the American Community Survey to make a prediction for 2015. And we have uh, uh, a prediction from the American Community Survey data only. And so the, the general idea here is that we, we have uh, two different types of models, and perhaps we can have more models. We can combine predictions for these two different models, given that sort of they're not completely orthogonal, but like they may sort of pick up different things. The time series model may sort of like give us, give us a sense of extrapolation of like ongoing trends, long-term trends. Facebook data might be useful to incorporate sort of recent shocks. If something happens that was unexpected, we may be able to pick that up from Facebook, not so much from the American Community Survey because the la latest data point might be two years old. 
And then we could combine that as a weighted average of the two models based on the past performance of, of the two models. So this is something uh, we're working on, and so I don't really have uh, additional results to show you on. I hope to be able to show you some results next time I see you, but I wanted to give you a sense of where, like, the direction of this project. Yeah. I think it's really interesting to bring in the time series. I, I thought you were going to bring in time series data from Facebook. Because one of the concerns you had expressed yeah. is about instability of this data source. Yeah. And so if, if, how would you think about trying to handle that with time series? Yeah, so that's a, uh, so that, that's a very good point. The, we've been collecting data for Facebook for about, like, uh, about a year now. It's so like every month we collect the data. But that's how long our time series is. And so in this context where we're sort of like, we're interested in long-term trends, that is not super useful. But for short term, that could be useful. If we have like stocks at different points in time, what we want to see is whether we can predict short-term flows based on these um, repetitions of uh, stocks. So if things are changed from month to month, maybe we can say something, but we cannot collect data for the past from this API. So that, that's, that's the tricky, the tricky part. But even for this one year, have you seen like, very unusual fluctuations? Uh, we didn't notice very unusual fluctuations. But like, what, what we see is that every time we collect the data, there are more users and more migrants. And so like, <laughs> the, the things are like going up. And, uh, and so perhaps some, some of those changes need to be filtered out but we didn't see big fluctuations. But it's a good idea that sort of uh, looking at the fluctuations might give us a sense of the variability in this data and at the extent to which we should rely, rely on those. And this like, yeah, the uncertainty as well. Yeah. Yeah so, yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question. And so for this type of data, there are definitely a number of issues related to measurement. Like it's not completely clear what is, like the sort of measurement issues. What uh, Facebook says is that those are people who come from one country, who previously resided in one country and now, and now reside in this uh, second country. That this is like, but we don't really know for how long they've been there or all these kind of things. So the definition is not, yeah, it's not super clear. And I, what we're trying to do is to sort of like reverse engineer this and say like, uh, if we, from the data, if we can come, like backtrack the, the, the definition in a way. Okay. so. So that was like, I wanted to show you an example with macro data. Now I want to show you an example with micro data. And this is about using geolocated Twitter tweets to study sort of relationship between short term mobility and longer term movements. And it's a joint project together with uh, Di Fiorio and a number of other uh, colleagues. So for, for this case, we have individual level data Twitter tweets with geographic coordinates attached when people post it on, uh, on Twitter. This is something that is part uh, of uh, a sort of panel data that we're trying to create. We started with a previous work that we wrote several years ago where we collected some, uh, uh, some Twitter tweets with geolocation. And since then, we've been following these people. Every so often, we update our, our sample. So we have a sample of about 60,000 users that initially, in the initial data collection, posted at least eight geotag tweets in the US between 2010 and 2013. And so we've been collecting those tweets over time. Can you explain what a geotag tweet is? Yes. So if I'm here yeah. and I tweet, and then I go to California and I tweet, would that be two tweets, two geocodes, or the same person? Is so, it a person or place-based code? So you need to have geolocation enabled. And so if you don't have it, probably no. 
probably there's no uh, geolocation attached to it. But if you do have geolocation enabled, every tweet has the geographic coordinates attached to it. So if you tweet from here now, you would have like the geographic coordinates of where you are right now, and the next tweet would have the geographic coordinates of where you are at but that it would point. Be still person specific. Yeah. So. So you know that I moved and gave tweets from two places. Yeah. So each user has a unique ID, and each tweet has a unique ID, mm -hmm. and uh, the and the and the geographic coordinates are attached to each single tweet. Yeah. Do most people actually deal, open up the deal? No, that's, it's a small percentage of people. It's something like maybe 3%, 5%, something like that. So it's a small proportion of the... Is that the default option? No, it's not the default. You actually have to enable it then? Yeah. And there are different types of uh, geolocation that you can enable. Some yeah, I'm not a tweeter, so I'm, you know, <laughs> there are other people that tweet their life out. But <laughs> yeah, so you, you can decide on this like, level of uh, coarseness. So we took those uh, geographic coordinates, and then we mapped them to, to the nine uh, uh, census divisions. And, uh, and so in this case, we're interested in flows rather than stocks. Yeah. Another Twitter-related question about bots. Like, yeah. How do you do bot detection? So, uh, oh, bots. Sorry, bot. sorry, I didn't hear what so, you said. Sorry, yeah. So, bots. in Twitter, not all the tweets are from people. Some yeah. of them are from bots that are doing all kinds of things. Yeah. The bots could move. I mean, the, if, because the reason why, because geolocation is unusual then that seems like the kind of thing bots might do. They sometimes do unusual things. So, <laughs> that's... Yeah, so, so that, that's a good question. And we, we, there's no guarantee that we remove the bots. There could be some bots in there. Like, our criteria was to sort of, uh, when we started this, and it was several years ago, we decided to choose some users who had been on Twitter for a long time. So we thought that like if those people had been, so if like several years ago, we looked at people who had been on Twitter for a long time, we sort of thought like those must be trusted users, like before like more and more bots sort of like jumped in. And so the idea is that by following those users, little by little we might lose some because they may stop tweeting or they may stop tweeting with geolocation, but they should be relatively more, relatively safer than the general Population, but that could that could be, and we wouldn't we wouldn't know. But you have it, so you could look. You mean we can look at? Uh, so it, we could potentially sort of pass it to some. So there are people who have worked on identifying bots, so we could probably pass our ideas to those, mm -hmm. and uh, and sort of like we will get an answer about the likelihood that uh, there are bots. But then like. Uh, I gave my ID and I was identified as a bot. So I don't know. <laughs> the, the, those tools are not necessarily perfect as well. <laughs> and so, so we consider these uh, uh, census divisions and the flows between, between them. And so the idea for, for this work is to evaluate whether rates of mobility or rates of migration change as we change the definition. So like the, the overall goal behind this is that perhaps we can say something about that. Maybe we can use some of these tools for harmonization of data. And we're thinking about uh, European countries where different countries have all sorts of different definitions. And we try to start with the US where we consider different, different divisions as sort of like different macro countries. And so there are two key concepts that we considered. One is the, so we're this time series of uh, uh, geographic coordinates for each user. And then there are two concepts that we consider. The duration, which is the sort of like the buffer around one period of time that we use in order to infer the residence of the person. And the interval, which is the period between two time points in order to establish whether there was migration between the two time points. So just to clarify that, this is a sort of illustrative example of data for two users. So the two panels have the same type of data, user one and user two. 
user one and user two tweet from location blue and location red. We want to know the residence of user one at time t. In this case, we have a short duration, a short buffer around time t, and we pick the most, uh, the modal location from where user one tweets as the residence. And so in this case, for the top panel, with short duration, we would say red and red. Whereas for the lower panel, if we increase the duration, then we will pick blue and blue. So if we have a short duration, like for in my case, for instance, with a short duration, I will be a resident of Prisnon. If I have like two days of duration, but if I have a two week span, I have enough time to go back to Seattle and post most of my tweets from <coughs> Seattle. So we looked at how the migration rate, the mobility rate changes as uh, we sort of change duration. And so as duration increases, as this buffer increases, migration rates tend to decrease. Then we also consider an uh, interval. So, so in this case, we keep the duration constant across the two panels, but we change the interval. So this, the, the distance between t and t++. plus plus. And so we looked at how uh, migration rates change as we change interval. And so as interval goes up, then uh, migration rates tend to go up. So we may be more likely to be in the same place one month, like next month, but perhaps in 10 years, we are more likely to be somewhere else. And so we put all of these together to get a sense of how migration rates change with respect to a combination of interval and, uh, and duration. And so uh, these types of data, we think that are potentially useful because we have these uh, uh, migration histories that we can sort of keep track of. And we wouldn't be able to sort of look at differences in terms of migration rates for the same people when we change interval and duration without this type of data. This was the flip side of it is that we don't really have ground truth data or like some sort of census data that we can compare this data with to see whether they, they make sense. And so, so far, our approach has been to, to look into as much, as many geolocated sources as we can to see whether some patterns are regular across uh, different platforms. So we've been looking into uh, cell phone data for Senegal and old social media that doesn't exist anymore, Gowalla, where people could uh, log in. And potentially we will look into administrative data from, uh, from Sweden. And so as an example, <clears throat> we see that, so these are relationships between migration rate and interval for data from Senegal. So these are called data records for Senegal, the Twitter data that we saw earlier, and the Gowalla. And so there are differences there, like the, this is something that we're working on right now, but the general idea is that we want to evaluate whether some of these patterns are consistent across situations. If something is consistent for Twitter users in the US, Senegal for, for, new, for users in well, phone users in Senegal and go voila, people who check in and so on, then we might sort of be uh, comfortable with the idea that those are fairly regular patterns. If there are discrepancies, then we may want to sort of look into why there are discrepancies and try to understand what's, um, what's explaining those. Yeah? Do you make any distinction between um, short distance migration? So like from Connecticut, California versus short, like Connecticut to New York, and are you able to tell the difference between migration versus just commuting behavior? Yeah, so that's uh, so that, that that's a very good question. Like we haven't really put too much sort of like space constraints into this. So the reason why we don't really look into sort of like short distance versus long distance is mainly because the sample in the end is not that big, and so that's why we sort of like aggregate things at. Uh, uh, at the level of census divisions. And so people who sort of cross the border are counted the same as, uh, so people who live near the border are potentially counted the same as people who are not at the border. And so that's, uh, 
So that's something that we should definitely take into account. We haven't done it mainly because of the constraints of, uh, of, of the sample. But yeah, it's a very good question. Okay, so, so this is an example of uh, that, uh, that line of work. And so now I would like to sort of say something about how these uh, works sort of fits in within uh, digital demography. Now, we have a number of people. I'm part of this uh, panel, this IUSSP panel on big data and population processes, which, is, uh, which includes a number of uh, uh, traditional demographers as well as computer scientists or people who, uh, people who work at Facebook, for example. People who work in the, in the industry. And so as part of this panel, what we've been trying to do is to sort of form a community or help form a community with, with a shared set of uh, tools and shared set of um, approaches. For instance, we've been running some training workshops that are specific. So at workshops in computational methods at population conferences or workshops in demographic methods at computer science conferences. And then at some venues like the International Conference on Web and Social Media, we use that for research workshops that bring together people from different, uh, different disciplines. And some other activities like a special issue of uh, a journal like demographic research. So there are lots of examples of uh, uh, research in this, or like this context of digital demography. And I just want to sort of give you, uh, just mention a few examples that include the use of geolocated tweets with modern statistical approaches to estimate population density, for example, or the use of uh, Google searches and Google trends with econometric approaches to now cast fertility or the combination of Twitter data plus text analysis and a natural experiment in order to evaluate the impact of laws like the SB 1070 that restricted immigration on attitudes towards migrants. Other examples include the combination of Google search activities to evaluate differences in the relationship between Google search activities for ultrasound and Sex, sex ratios at birth across Indian states, or the use of Facebook data and network analysis to map the communities of uh, migrants, and approaches related to survey methods, such as using Facebook Ads Manager, the same uh, tool that I described, to survey hard to reach populations like Polish migrants in Austria. So I stopped before they ask for your credit card and you can set an ad, but you can also go ahead and create an ad and ask people to participate in a survey. And so this is just like, these are just a few examples of uh, this type of research that is done that is at the intersection of uh, uh, computational social science, digital, digital research, and, uh, and demography. And so I, I sort of pointed out to those examples because I wanted to say that the digital revolution is really changing how we do demography, but not necessarily the reasons behind it. For instance, a lot of the examples that I, they showed address the same fundamental questions that we are interested in in, in demography. We want to understand. Uh, so for example, we may be interested in uh, attitudes towards migrant, but we may we may consider not only surveys, but also what people post uh, online. And that may give us some different uh, measurements of uh, the same type of uh, uh, phenomenon. Or we, in the past, we recruited survey participants only with landline land, <coughs> land phone numbers. Now we can also do it with uh, Facebook data. And so at the same time, this data also allow us to uh, address a number of new questions that previously we couldn't. And so in particular, I think the geolocated data, together with migration histories for a large number of countries, may potentially help us sort of discover some regularities in mobility patterns and relationships between, say, internal migration and international migration, or short-term mobility and long-term migration. So 
I think that in this area, the road ahead is uh, exciting and difficult. That's what makes it rewarding. And I think that developing methods is, uh, is really key in, uh, in this area. Eventually, all these data, all these digital traces will become just any standard data. We will know what they're useful for and what they're not useful for. And there will become some common knowledge, like uh, the same way we interpret life tables now. We know the assumptions behind them. We know when they're useful, why they're useful, and, and so on.